doing audio. How are we doing? We have a random person on there. It's pin. Okay, I think they can hear me now. My phone is going nuts. We have not started recording yet. I, oh, we are recording. Okay, we are recording now. We are recording. We got three people. People are just multiplying here. I love it. Let's start with some screen share here and do our usual uh, what's going on with the world today type stuff. Okay. And hopefully, my onliners, uh, let's see, I might turn, turning my audio down so we don't hear the blings. Okay, I can see your guys' chat, and you can see everything there. Make sure you're muted, stop your videos, I'll stop them for you if need be. And we should have the videos at the top. So I think many of you have found this, and let's see. But if you log into my Pearson, log into my Pearson one, you should be on my Pearson. We have some exciting news, right, Isabella, about the assignment? We'll give that out in a moment here. So exciting news to come that hopefully you guys like. If you don't like it, then we won't do it, but we'll, we'll see how the crowd responds to it. So log into my Pearson. Um, one of the changes I made is, and I think this is really great. Oh, I think we have everyone enrolled. Congrats, everybody. Um, I changed this tab to lectures and PowerPoints. So this tab right here is lectures and PowerPoints. And now next to each lecture is the associated video lecture. So if you want to go back and check it out, you can just click on the video lecture next to it and boom, you'll be watching this video that we have right here. So today's video, if you're watching it, will appear here as a link to video lecture. We've got some audio as per usual. Sorry, everybody. Here we go. Mute. Mute. Make sure you are muted when you come in. I wish I could give someone else superpowers, make them mod. How's everyone doing? Perfect. They love this. Awesome. Thank you, guys. So everyone who responded there, five points. Give some five points. You guys in class, 10 points as per usual. You guys knocking out of the park. So everyone sees where this is at. Love that you guys are noticing this. You can see where it's at. Pretty easy to find your lectures. So if you are reviewing and you're like, man, I can't remember what lecture that was, you just click on the lecture next to it. It'll be the associated lecture with that chapter. And we try to keep them as concise as possible, bound together. And I'll try to mute any noises we hear, and I'll try to deal with that problem over the weekend because that's probably a one hour fix to figure out all the settings that need to be adjusted. Not a quick fix. So here we are, video lecture right here. You click it, you go to the YouTube channel. As per usual, there's me looking down at that last lecture. And we have 87 views, what? Wow, we usually don't get that many views till we get the reviews. Thanks to everyone watching it. Uh, that's really good for you guys. Uh, watch it up. No dislikes yet. That's always good. Um, also, I want to re-highlight to you guys two assignments are due tonight. Two assignments. And I think, have you guys done them? Done them? How long did it take? No. 10 minutes. Not long. Done. Love it, Lynette. Awesome job. Bailey says five minutes. Nice job, Bailey. And so when you go in, if you are stuck on them, because probably the most difficult thing for people is the rain, no rain question. That one crushes people. The rain, no rain question, I show you how to solve it in the video right here. I will answer your emails. I will answer every email as quickly as possible. If someone in the chat say, Brian emailed me back within how long? And tell the truth. Be like, Brian emailed me back within 48 hours. I do not know. Surely someone online has emailed me. 30 minutes. True, super fast, one hour. I will email you back, as long as I'm not eating, watching a TV show, or who knows what. But I try to email you back as quickly as possible in about 45 minutes. I'm sorry, Carson, I'll do better next time. Carson, five points, because I let you down. So uh, <laughs> there were people who said an hour on there too. But so once again, I want to reiterate to you, help is at every corner. One of the biggest things I'm trying to stress right now is I want you to start this semester out on a good foot. I want you to start out with like, <laughs> he was taking a nap, it was cool. Um, I want you to start the semester out on a good foot. I want you to know what's happening in the class. I want you to have good grades. So please, if there's any questions at this point, ask away and let's get to our little surprise and make you guys happy. Please think of any questions while I go down here to your assignment manager. I say, you know what? We got a three day weekend, right? How about we take this assignment that's due Friday night and we go to settings for class and we change it. What do you guys think about uh, Monday night? You guys like that? There's a yes for this ELQ. This is the ELQ. Does everyone understand? This is the ELQ, the longer stuff. 
And they, there's the, the, the crowd likes it. Okay, cool. They're cool with it. They're happy. We're going to save and assign that. Um, so this was due on Friday. It's a longer assignment. It is now due Monday night, I believe. We'll double check. Once again, you can always check. Onliners are loving this. They're very happy about it. Everyone, thank you guys. I'll, I'll, there we go. Monday night. It is now on Monday night. You, you can have the weekend to do it. You can relax on Saturday, Sunday. <laughs> Let us do the happy dance. I love it. So we have this right here. We are good to go. Um, <laughs> oh man i love the online chat there used to be one guy in one semester who just made a ton of jokes it, like everything was a joke and it was it kept the class pretty lively thank you to everyone so uh mallory five points i like it so um or bianca and bianca and both mallory okay any any questions here anything anything please tell me what's going on what you what you need to know Remember, we have two assignments due tonight. I want to keep stressing that. Two due tonight. Very easy to do. I emailed the people who didn't have it done yet. I'll probably email again at 9 p.m. or so, being like, hey, last reminder. Because these are like five, six minutes of your time to just like hundreds. And, and do them again to get 100, right? Freebie 100. We will drop three assignments from this first test. You'll literally only have to make 100 on like five more assignments. This is about making hundreds, and then you can have a perfect quiz grade. People achieve that in this class. Perfect online quiz. We want that. So we will drop three from this first section. Getting two 100s to start gets you on a good step to getting all 100s. Because you can make less than 100 on three, but don't use it on the first. Any last questions? Anything? Anyone? We look to be pretty good. Well, that was, that was good. I, th I thought they'd be happy, right? I was just debating. I was like, three-day weekend. Let's, let's do it. So we're going to go here to lecture and PowerPoint. So let's, let's start lecturing. We are, I think my watch is a little bit off. We are almost 10 minutes in, and it is time for lecture. It takes a moment to load, so I'm going to fix my watch. I'm going to see if there's any questions. Looks like it was deleted. It is 5.13. My watch sometimes loses a minute or two, and it confuses me, and that could be very bad. Um, I was, I was, I said to my class one time, I was like, we have five more minutes and everyone looked at me all weird. And then I looked at the clock in the back and I was like, oh, uh, actually it's time to leave. So, um, yeah. Clocks that are on time are the best. Oh, okay. So let's start this up. Let's get right to the learning. Here we are. Last time, we covered what kind of variable. This is a good review of last time just to ask that question. I thought we already had a response online. I was like, they're on fire. And they are. Bailey for five points. And Bianca and Veronica all say five points for categorical. Categorical questions are things that put people or items into groups. So it's a grouping variable, such as we have hair color. Uh, what color is your shirt? It doesn't have to be colors. It could be uh, what's your gender. What college did you go to? What school did you go to for grad school? All these different things. It just puts people or things into categories. But today, we change the name of the game. We go to quantitative. As we did last time, and we need to know this, start typing the quantitative variables online. My in-classers got a chance for another five points today right here with my favorite quantitative variable of the day. Tell me some really cool quantitative variables. Let's see. First answer. Uh, right there, you get five points right there. Five points on the first answer. Um, what, quantitative questions. What are quantitative questions? This sets our mind up. Go ahead. How old are you? How many people in your class? What class did you go to? Like uh, art, right? Checking you. Checking you. Yes, yes, yes. For a moment, I thought we were back to categorical, and I was like, wait, I was like, you said it so assuredly. So yes, how many pets do you have quantitative? Five points to all my classers. Nice job. So we got online. Number of siblings, number of people in stats, number of pets. Wait, wait, everyone wants to know my weight. How many people in your class, your age, your, your weight, your height? How old do you guys think I am? What is Brian's age? I told you guys. 25, 22, 19. <laughs> no one, everyone's saying I'm younger than I am, which is awesome. Oh, no. Sharon, five points. Sharon knows I'm 35. Maybe I said it somewhere. I'm 35. Uh, my favorite question. Uh, my favorite question right here. Weird noise. I like number of cousins. I'm going to go with number of cousins. I have a lot of cousins. I have like uh, 
25, 30 cousins. It's always craziness. We go to the family get togethers and then my cousins have children now. So it's just huge family get togethers and that's always good fun. So, uh, yes, <laughs> it's its own Sam 17. <laughs> that's interesting. I am, I am a bit older than 17. Okay. So these are all quantitative questions. And if you notice, as when I asked you, how old is Brian? Oh, 17 cousins. Yes, yes. When I asked you how old I am, you all gave me numbers. You gave me number responses were actual real numbers. So this lets us know what a quantitative variable is. It under, puts in our mind what we are learning for this chapter, actual real numbers. And now we will display them. And let's check this out. So what we have is a distribution. A distribution is just a visualization of data. Moreover, we usually use quantitative distributions. So when we look at this distribution right here, it'll be the tsunamis from 2000 BC to present and the magnitude of them. So of them. So when we look right here, it looks kind of like a graphic we've already seen. What graphic does it look like that we've already seen? Bar graph, five points. Bar, first person bar on there, Megan, five points. It looks like a bar graph. But wait, 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 Brian, you, you told me bar graphs are only for quantitative variables. Bar graphs are only for quantitative variables. So why is this working? Why can we do it right here? This is no longer a bar graph. This is called a histogram. I think we have a... Something drew on there. Do not use the annotate. I need to remove permissions. So we have here a histogram, and the histogram is for univariate quantitative data. Histograms are for univariate quantitative data. Great note right there. A histogram is a univariate quantitative display of data. Histograms have with them what we call bins. And let's zoom in right here and see if you guys can figure out for me what is the bin width here? Well, okay, we have six to seven. One, two, three, four, five bins between. Nice job, Jonathan, five points, and also Carson figuring it out. The bin width is 0.2. Nice job following along. Does everyone understand how 6.2, 6.4, 6.6, 6.8, 7? When we read, we read from left to right. The first number in each bin is the leftmost number. So 6.2 would be in this bin or the next one? 6.2 will be in the next bin. 6.2 is in the next bin. So the first number is it. Nice job on liners. Mallory, five points. Lots of points there. Keep it up. Keep, keep interacting. Love it. So it's in the next bin. This is where 6.2 goes, this is where 6.4 goes. What, where would 6.199999999 go? This bin right here that I'm in right here. So it's where the leftmost number is up to the next leftmost number. So you can see this with, um, let's go here and let's Google a histogram. So let's go histogram and let's see one that has where we can see the bin widths. Okay, good, there's many of them right here. So this picture right here, view image, boom in on it so here is where 70 would go into this bin where would 71 go same bin where would 75 4.9 go same bin where would 75 go next bin right here where are the most numbers between what and what or starting at what going up to but not including what where are the most numbers nice job i heard it online they're saying it online a lot the most numbers or the most occurrences were between 75 to 80, not including 80, but 75 up to 80. Nice job on liners. Man, you guys are doing excellent. Work. So there's so many different histograms to look at. I love just going to Google image search. You don't always get all the numbers between the bins. So sometimes when we have to figure out a bin width, like the bin width for these is what? Be careful, this is a good trick question on the test. These are easy questions. But people will look at this and they'll say what? They will say 20, but everyone online is saying, nice job, everyone online is saying 10. It's just the width of the bins, but the number line does not always coincide with that. So watch out, it's just, if you put 90 there, it might look too cramped. So they visually decide to not put it. But bin widths are just the widths of the bins, simply take a known area and then divide it. 
for this, it would be hard to figure out. Uh, well, I guess there's four between. Each bin width is $25. Does everyone see how I can figure out the bin width here is $25? 800 to 900. How many bins are between there? Four. What's the length of this line right here? 100 divided by four. Does everyone understand how to find bin widths? Yes. You should be able to logically say 825, 850, 875, 900. Easy test question. What is the bin width? If you're really scared you got it wrong, just start writing the numbers between and see if it's a constant increase. Bin widths will always be constant. You don't, a weird histogram or a wrongly computed one will have differing bin widths, and there's usually one person who decided to make a graphic like that, and it's incorrect to do that. Sometimes there's one, but not. Lots of cool histograms there. Okay, okay. To clarify, one bin is one bar. That is correct. Clarification question points, five points for Mallory. Nice job, Mallory, good question. A bin width is merely one bar. The bin width is one bar. So each of these is a bin right here because that's where it collects the data and then we can talk about the frequency of the observations in the bin, like how many observations were in that bin. The, most, the bin with the most observations was the bin from what to what here? The bin with the most observation was the bin from what to what? Seven to 7.2, another five points right there. Seven to 7.2, the bin with the most observations. When you see it, it has the peak right here. Great job. So we saw a frequency on the left, and now we look at a relative frequency. All we do is divide by the total. To get a relative frequency, just take the amount there are a total of lots of lots in here, maybe like a thousand or so, like two thousand, and then divide by that total. So now we just have the relative frequency of how many occur. This is the relative frequency, and it's just in percent or in decimal. Either is all right. It's just relative to how many there were. Nothing too much going on there. Our software will actually choose for us the right amounts of bins. This is not a nice test question. This one's a nice test question. What are the bin widths of the top histogram? Oh, 2.5. Yes, good, 2.5. It is 2.5, don't be tricked by the number line. Great job everyone online. Give yourself five points if you did. I might lower the extra credit. Everyone who typed 2.5 there, give yourself five points. Um, and if you typed five, I'll still give you five points. But the answer is 2.5. Um, don't be deceived by the number line. Make sure you look at the width of each bar because the bar is the bin. But when you have a bar chart, you can just move things around. If you have a number line, can you move things around? You can't because they need to be in order because you can't just be like, well, I'm going to take this one and move it over here. Number lines have to be in order. So this is a histogram. It does have bins like a bar chart does where the data goes to tell you how many observations there were, i.e. the count. But these are quantitative observations. You had to ask, what was your height to get the information for this? And then we see a lot of people are in the bin six, uh, five, five to five, seven point five. A lot of moderately tall females and moderately shorter guys. Cause like five, seven for a girl is kind of tall, right? And five, seven for a guy is kind of short. So we see this is kind of where maybe both collide. Do these come from two different data sets? No. They're the exact same data set. And I think, I'm gonna show you guys something cool here. I like showing you guys the future if anyone decides to go into business analytics. So this is my one minute aside right here to show you the cool future. Ooh, what were they programming in? Oh my gosh, look what we see right here. What do you think that command does? I did not, oh wait, where'd it go? Let me bring it back up. Was oh, it gone? Did you see what it said? It was histograms which we can make those, uh, sorry. Oh wait, let's just pull up a package that's in here already. Uh, let's go with CO2 and there's the CO2. Let me, you do not need to know how to do any of this. Do not worry. Um, could not find the view function, that's fine. Okay, so I've got my CO2 data set right here and I'm gonna make a histogram of it of C-O-N-C, sure, or uptake. You do not need to do any of this. I'm just going to view a histogram right here. I want to do from the CO2 data set, dollar sign. I can't type anything correctly today, guys. There we go. Let's go uptake. 
Here is a histogram right here, right? This is what we've been seeing. But I can change, let me put breaks equals one. That's, this, that's a histogram also. How many bins are there? How many bins? Well, now it's doing two different breaks, but if I increase this, I'm changing the bin width. Does this make sense? These are all the same histograms or the same data, but I'm just changing the breaks to ridiculous things. Now there's too many breaks on there. So when you change this right here, it changes the way it looks and makes them little tiny lines because now there's 8,000 breaks. So this right here is all the same data, even when I display it like this, but that looks a lot better, right? Our statistical software, and what I'm just trying to highlight for you right here is, if you change the bin widths, it'll look different, but it's the same data, right? Our statistical software will automatically decide the correct amount of breaks. So you don't have to worry about that. It'll do it for you, and it'll choose the bin widths. So all these things right here. Aha, this is where Brian Stevens got lost the first time he learned statistics. The first time I learned statistics and we did STEM and LEAP, I was like, what in the world? But check this out. A STEM and LEAP plot is exactly the same as a histogram, except you can now what? What do you think these are? They're the observations and you can see them. And to prove to you, someone says, no, Brian, that's not the exact same. And I say, no, it is. I will prove it. So let me prove it to you that this is the exact same by simply rotating it and then flipping it up and check it out. Now tell me, is that the exact same? As in, there is one observation here, there is four observations here, four here, four here, four here, six here, and one there. It is the exact same thing. Mind blown, I love it. I didn't realize this, so this is like, a stem and leaf is a univariate display of quantitative data, just like a histogram, but you can see the numbers. So if you wanted, you could just draw on top of this and just put, I can't draw on top of this one apparently. I bet I could somehow, if I was better at this. But you could just draw boxes over it, draw the bins. Notice how the bin width here, it's easy to see here, but this goes to 60, 65, 70. What is the bin width? Five, and then look, the upper 50s, the lower 60s, the upper 60s, the lower 70s, the upper 70s, the lower 80s, the higher 80s. Does that all make sense? What is the lowest observation in this data set? A little hard to tell right now, right? What is the lowest observation in this data set? 56, nice job, nice job, 56. What's the highest observation? 88. So we can tell the observations. How could we figure out how many observations there are here? Just count. One, two, three, four, five, six. So that's seven, let's go right here. That's 16, seven plus 16, 23. Is there 24? 24 observations. And you could just count right here. Four here, four here, four here, but you can also see them. An important thing, Bailey, another five points. Nice answer, Bailey. Thank you, everyone, answering online. I love all those answers. We go here to stem and leaf. Stem and leaf plots, let's look at a few just to see what we could see on the test and quiz ourselves. Well, let's see. Okay, this one's great. We are going to have kindergartners throw a baseball. So these are kindergartners. Don't hold it against them. Uh, so what's going on right here? What's, what, what does this mean? What's going on there? What happened? Is that 9.0, is it? What, why is that blank? There are no observations, and, correct. Nice answer, Nikki, five points. No observations, also will. There are, oh my God, everyone who said that, so many answers, you guys have a nice job. There are no observations right there. There was no one, no one threw nine points anything. What is the bin width here? You can tell me even the units. The bin width here is, these are all review questions, great stuff. One foot, one foot. The bin width is one foot, does that make sense? Because you just have to look to the distance for this, but you have to watch out because stem and leaves have keys. 
Down here it tells us 3-2 is 3.2 feet. So what, is, what does this mean right here? This is a kindergartner who threw it 6.1 feet. What kindergartner threw it the farthest? They threw it 10.5. You guys are so quick. I can't even take a sip of coffee. I like it. Five points. So 10.5 feet. What kindergartner threw it the, the least? The, the, the 2.0. All these great answers online. Online blown out of the park. We'll go here. We'll look at another one. Get, get all the stem and least we can find. Remember, we want to look at the key. The key will always tell us what's going on with this. Um, not all keys are obvious. Um, we have here per, per capita GDP, GNP of Western Africa. And which country had the gross national product or something like that that was the highest? The highest one was what? 890, you're ready for a hard question. What is the bin width here? Careful, that would be a good trick question on a test. Oh my gosh, onliners. Five points to all you onliners. You're racking it up today. Keep this up online. Not one. They got it. They figured it out. I'll, I'll say it here in a second. What is it? Oh, it's 100. Nice job. Yeah. That's, and that that's, looks like you're like, oh, but one and two have a difference of one, but that's in units of 100. Because the key down here tells you 4-80 is 480. So each of these is a difference of 100 units. So very, very keen eye online, destroying it today. You guys are getting a lot of points. I'll slow it down. So we see some examples of some stem and leaves. I like to pull up as many as possible. We see the same thing going on right here. This is jump output, which you'll see on your test. And it's showing you how to read a stem and leaf where 5-6 equals 56. Bin width here is five because we have the lower, the upper 50s, the lower 60s, the upper 60s. Um, since these are 50s and 60s and there's divided by two, 60s have 10 numbers in it. Going from 60 to 69, that's 10 numbers. Just take the zero and put it up top, and you have one to 10. So uh, divide 10 by two, it's a length of five. Because the lower bin contains zero, one, two, three, four. I know I said up to four, but remember zero is a number, so that's five numbers. The upper bin contains five, six, seven, eight, nine, and that's five numbers also, so it's a length of five. We have confirmed. So everything has been what I've been saying right here. This number to start is not an observation. It's just a placeholder for data. It literally serves the same purpose as this number line right here. Like this line you see right here is this line. There is not data below here. It's the same thing. Um, how that bin width is five, sure. So to know what the bin width is, we first need to say we need to find a distance. It's a great question, five points for the question. Keep asking. So the distance from here to here is what? This is the 60s. The 60s have how much data in it? How many ops? What's the length from lower 60 to upper 60? Like all of the 60s is a length of 10. How many bins are between here and here? Two. So two divided by 10 is five. And that's how you'd figure it out. Sometimes it's not as tricky, it's easy to see. Uh, we'll do one more of those just to make sure. And please, if you do understand, ask again. I'll try to reformulate but we'll try to do another one right here. That's maybe a little bit less obvious. Um, usually we don't make it that tricky. I, I try to throw as tricky of questions as possible when, we're, when we talk about these. That way we can cover ourselves for a test. Um, we do need a key to know. Ooh, that's weird. That is not a good stem and leaf that person made. Um, you might see bad graphics every once in a while. Wow, that's a fun thing to talk about. <laughs> Okay, what is the bin width here? This is a bit of an easier one. What is the bin width here? Uh-oh. 10. It is 10 because 6-8 means 68. This is the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, and the 100s. So this would stand for 100, where this would stand for 96. So does that make sense to everybody? There are no observations in the 70s. How many, really quick question, how many total students did we ask them their grade of? This is grades of students on a test. How many total students did we talk to? 10 students. The right here are your observations. This is just the number line part of it. Everything in the stem is merely just the lower number line part, like this right here and this below here are the connecting lower number line part. Here's your observations in the stem and leaf. Here's your observations in the histogram. 
and they can both show you the same thing. Good stuff. This is an activity you can do on your own if you want. Uh, it's just putting stem and leaves. We can do side-by-side -side stem and leaves, but you're just doing one quantitative distribution for one group and another quantitative distribution for another. You would merely just put in here the numbers for all the instructors. I think there's only one 100, but you could put over here, see it never serves to, when I used to do this in class, I can write on the screen, but they can't see me write on the screen. We have a 94 also, right? 94, and I think that's it, right? So you can add in these numbers here, and then you could also um, do it for the other side. And then Professor B's grades, what did they have in the 90s? 95. There we go, 94, thank you. There we go, 95 and 299s. And then you could add it all in. And you would actually see kind of the distributions of grades to see if, oh, there's more high grades in Professor B than there are Professor A, depending on how these look. So we could make these side-by-side -side, uh, stem and leaf or back-to-back -back stem and leaves. Nothing too crazy. Does everyone understand what's going on? Because now we get into shape, center, spread. Shape, center, spread, unusual features. And that's, uh, see, I need, to, I need to, we need to change the notes because a student told me that she learned you have to cuss at distributions. I'll explain why. Because you heard shape, center, spread, unusual features. So she would say center, unusual features, spread, shape. But I've always said shape, center, spread, unusual features. But she was like, no, you cuss at them, Brian. And I was like, whoa, calm down. But I thought that was interesting, and that's how she first learned it. Um, I was like, I'm going to use that. And then I, I don't know, didn't use it yet. Had you heard that before? I don't know if Mallory had heard that. Mallory said yes. <laughs> oh, so no one's heard that before. Is from another class, another way of teaching this. So let's talk about shape, a very good place to start. When we talk about shape, the first thing we're gonna talk about is the humps. Now, there are words for this. We have heard sometimes mode. Has anyone heard mean, median, mode? I'm sure you guys have heard that, mean, median, mode. Yes, everyone's heard that. What does mode mean? Change it to another four letter word instead of mode, it means most often, and that's the way I learned it when I was a kid. Mode means most often. Where modal is basically that. Modal or modality speaks to a most often area. Modal or modality speaks to a most often area. Modal or modality. So you can ask what is the modality of it or how many modes does, it, does the distribution have? Now if you ask what is the mode in the data set, that is a question of what is the most often number. Just to clarify again, what is the mode in the data set? What is the most often number? Where is the mode in the distribution? Where is the most often area? Please tell me, in this distribution right here, the mode of this distribution is close to what? And boom, online they see it, seven, nice job. Seven is where the mode, talking about like where the modal is, the modality of it, it has a, a peak around seven, a hump. So we need to be able to talk about the modality of it. So when we talk about modality, we can have unimodal or bimodal. And what do you think bi stands for? Just like, boom, wild guess. <laughs> Tell me your mind's blown here, I'll be like, wow, I, this is easy class. No, <laughs> but uh, bi means two. Unimodal means one mode. So we learn modal means most often area, this has two most often areas. And I like to say that, you know, you want there to be kind of clear mountain ranges because it's not really bimodal if there's not a good valley between them. Let's look. I will be fixing all our audio stuff. So let's pull this up right here and let's go to bimodal distribution. Google image search, there's a nice bimodal distribution. This one is bimodal. That's very bimodal. Some of these, I'm trying to find one I disagree with. But Google Image Search is pretty good about that. That's some really cool 3D stuff right there. If you see, wait, what is this? Actually, that's, that's, it looks like a scatter plot to me. <laughs> Google Image Search is not perfect. Um, everything here looks to be pretty bimodal. Wait, wait, wait. This is trimodal though, right? Is it? If you went and hiked this mountain, would your friend be impressed? I mean, I know this mountain's smaller. This is the impressive mountain, right? 
But doesn't this just look like a little tiny offshoot of this mountain? Like, yes. And that's where I'm talking about watch out. Don't be like, oh, it's got a third bump right there, trimodal. No, it needs to have clear peaks. You need to see clear separation. And hopefully like this is enough of separation right here. I would call that bimodal, even though the second one's smaller. You could tell that there are two peaks. The first one's a much larger peak in the distribution. The, the first peak is much stronger. This is another clear mode right here. You, ah, oh, wait, wait, look at that right there. Well, watch out, don't do that. I think the previous, we got some sort of comic there. I would be, I'm not sure if this is bimodal. That just looks like um, what we'll talk about in a half second here. We got one more concept before we get to that. But we also have the concept of uniform. Can you not, can you guys not see my slides? No, I think they're saying they just can't see it. I, I was worried there. Okay, good. Everything's good. So um, uniform, break it down. What do you think uniform is? Don't go all crazy. Just what might uniform mean? And people get this wrong on test. Uniform might mean, everyone's saying all the same. And I, and I agree, but I agree it's all the same, but break down the word uniform. Break it down. Like pretend you have to say uniform just means blank, blank. Wait, boom, 10 points. Right there, the first, first, first people said one form, you got it. One form, it's one form, it, it has no differences. This is a pretty good uniform distribution, but if you Google uniform, you will see even more uniform. Nice job, 10 points to all those people. I'm just going crazy with some PC today. What in the world is, oh, uniform? Oh, ha ha ha. This is what happens when you're a stat person, and you're like, what, shouldn't uniform just always show a uniform distribution? Um, this is a quintessential uniform distribution where usually when you do things, you see something like this. That's, that's pretty uniform. It's just kind of random shaky across. That's good uniform right there too. But that's, that up top is textbook uniform. This is unimodal down below. That is textbook uniform. You rarely see that. You more often see things in practice. That'd be really good. And someone's like, no, Brian, it's got a peak. No, it doesn't. It's pretty uniform across. Uniform, one form like a bread box. And what Brian saw earlier was an example of the distribution not being symmetric. We have two things possible. The distribution is either symmetric or it is skewed. So if you can fold it over on top of itself, it is symmetric. That's what symmetry means. Just take that piece of paper and fold it, and that's how they teach you in school, and that's what we do here. So when it's not symmetric, it is skewed. Write this down, great note to take. Left to the low, right to the high. The skew follows the tails. Left to the low, right to the high. I wish there was an R word, right to the, I don't know. Left to the low makes sense though, right? If it's skewed to the left, which is the low, then the tail is pulled to the left. Left to the low, right to the high. Follow the tail. Right to the raised, I guess. I don't know, I'll have to rework that, I like that. If you can find a better way, I might give some extra credit. And I'll start saying that from here on out. But left to the low, right to the high. And so, um, you almost need to rhyme with low, but I don't think it's a good word with that. Nice word play, left to the low. And that's the easy one, remember. Left to the low, right to the high. It's just the way the tail is pulled out. The skew follows the tail. I can't make that clear enough. Usually there's outliers on the side of the skew. So if it's skewed to the right, you'll see a tail pulled out to your right. So it's got the hump and the tail's pulled out to the right. And that was the distribution I saw earlier. And I was like, I don't think that's really bimodal. I think it's just some right skew with outliers. So we have outliers. Outliers are things that are far away from the central bulk of data. So outliers are just stragglers. And is it bad to be an outlier? How about on a, um, how about on a uh, organic chemistry test? Bailey says no. Not at all? They say not at all? I guess it depends, and that's the biggest answer. A lot of, a lot of statistics, a lot of everyone's saying yes and no's, but um, a lot of statistics depends because, ooh, depends on who's taking the test. And it depends on like what kind of outlier you are. If you make a zero on the test, how do you feel? You're an outlier, it's like, oh, that's great. You make 110 on the test, much better, right? So outliers really depend. Outlier does not mean good or bad. Um, outlier just means you are away from the central bulk of data. Oftentimes, an outlier is accompanied by a gap. Outliers and gaps are best friends because pretty much a gap in a distribution makes an outlier. So let's go with skewed data for the win. Uh, and here we are. 
some skewed data. This has some outliers on the right side right here. Um, I want to see a gap though. Surely someone has some data with a gap. Boom, right here. There's the gap in the data. It's hard to see, but you see how each, like at this bin right here, there's a hundred observations in this bin. This is maybe like two and five observations. There's very few observations. But usually you see this and there's a gap with outliers. Here's your gap, here's your outliers. This is a blank, blank skewed distribution. Fill in the gaps. This is a blank, blank skewed distribution. Nice, yeah, there's one in the AQ. Nice, nice that we're on the AQ. It is a right skewed, one more word for it. Right skewed. Unimodal. Five points right there. I got beat them to it. I was waiting on unimodal, right skewed, unimodal distribution. It's a unimodal, right skewed distribution. Nice job. Onliners each get one point for that. Great job, onliners. Keep up the responses. It's going to make me hand out all the extra credit. Um, great job, onliners. I, I love it. You get to answer questions while you do this. It's so much fun. So here we are. There we go. Hey, what do you know? I like doing image searches, though. You can always look over the notes a thousand times. Let's pull some new images in. So how many outliers are there in this distribution? Ten points for his first person who tells me. Oh, Dylan, ten points. Dylan got it first. There are three outliers. How do I know this? One, two, three, and then four is probably right here, and then five. Do you see this is the number of cities? If we trace this over, that looks to hit at about three, right? If you were to put lines on here, and if this is smaller, and this is smaller, this has to be one, two. These are discrete amounts because they're how many observations there were. So Dylan, nice job, 10 points. A lot of people always tell me there's one outlier, but no, 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 there's three cities there that are in that bin. So there are three low outliers. Does that make sense? The bin widths here are pretty wacky. You'd have to divide this distance, one, two, three, four, five. You'd have to divide 0.375 by five to get the bin widths here. I hate it when we write test questions that are that complicated. Any questions on this? A lot of people ask me why, I think we explained clearly, there are three low outliers right here because this is one city, two city, three city. The, this is how many cities are in there, the count of how many cities are in this bin that have observations between about 2.625 and 2.7. So even though those two outer bins are not after the gap, they are still an outlier. Um, which, two outer, uh, which two outer bins? I do not see. So even though those two outer bins are not after the gap, so the outers are what is after the gap, not in the, so uh, it really depends. Great, great question. So, so really good question. When we talk specifically about outliers, we are kind of loosely defining them now as things that are far away from the data. We will actually talk about outliers more today, near the end of the lecture, um, where we actually give a definition for what an outlier is. So uh, if you want to directly define an outlier, I will answer that for you in about 15 minutes. Whoops, not that quickly. Actually, I must have known right there. So now we've done shape. Shape has with it, we have the we have the, uh, I can't even think. We have the humps of the data. We have with it the skew of the data, outliers and gaps. That's what you should have in shape to say the humps of the data, the skew or not skew of the data, symmetry, the outliers and the gaps. Well, when we get to center right here, we have a concept of center called median. Median is known as the 50th percentile of the data. The 50th percentile of the data is your median. And you can simply put your numbers in order and then select the middle number. Hence, if you have five numbers, this number right here, the middle finger, is the middle number. But if you have four numbers, is there a middle number now? Is there a middle number with four numbers? No. You would have to average together the two middle numbers. And for those who have a TI calculator, I beg of you, go to the Stat Tool 1 YouTube channel and go to five numbers summary, TI, stat tool on UTK. It's under the TI list, and this will show you how to do the five number summary in your calculator, which will get you the median. So you can get the median on your TI calculator and always get it correct, along with the mean, the standard deviation, and this is just doing five number summary on your calculator. You will burn through the ALQ, right? It'll just be like a joke. You'll just be like, type in numbers, done. 
So use your TI calculator for the five number summary. And on this, you can also get mean and stuff like that using one bar stats. This video goes over it. If you can't find it, I'll send it to you. And it's just under the TI calculator tutorials that are down here near the bottom of the page. That's not good. good. TI tutorials right here, five number summary. So I try to make the list for you guys to see what's going on. So that is the easiest way to find the median. Highly suggest using the TI. There's other ways. More often we want you to understand what the median is though. Once again, what is the median? Online type that definition of what the median is. The median is the what of the data. 50th percentile, nice job. It's the 50th percentile. Kind of like the, it's the middle number, 50th percentile. So I could interpret this and I would say the 50th percentile of this data for ages of students, pretending that's what it is, is 21. If we say on the test, interpret the median, you want to interpret it in context. The 50th percentile for ages of students is 21. Where this one, the 50th percentile for ages of students is 24. Now this one is an average because there's no middle number with eight. With eight numbers, you have to choose by averaging the two numbers. But once again, to interpret a median in context, which does appear on the test, the 50th percentile for ages of students is 24. And now I'm pretending what, wow, we got, got someone really old taking stats one up there. But you'll notice something. If this person, this elderly person, were to make it to 200, what would happen to the median? What would happen? It stayed the same. Okay, what, okay, maybe they'll do a thousand, just some weird thing. Why is it staying the same? Because we're not changing the middle numbers. This is an outlier. Medians are impacted or are not impacted by outliers. Lied. I lied. <laughs> they are not impacted by outliers. They are not impacted by outliers. They're also minimally impacted by skew. The medians are what we use when we have skewed or outlier data sets. So medians are good when we have skew or outliers. Medians are for non-normal data. Good start there. Spread. The range. I think you guys know this. Turns out last year the lowest score on the test for stats one was a 20, and the highest for the final was 100. What is the range of that data set? 80. Did you even really think, you just saw it, right? Do you just see 20, to 20, 100, difference is 80. You don't type in the calculator, you just think it, you see it. The range is the difference between the minimum value and the maximum value. It's just the range of the data. Uh, the range is the youngest person in this class is 20, 80, and the oldest person in this class is 40. What's the range? 20. Nice, you guys are just crushing it. So we know the range is the lowest value, minus or the maximum value minus the lowest value if you reverse them it comes out negative and they say well it can't be negative it must be positive so the range is a positive difference between the two values the lowest one the data set and the highest one the data set but now your mind shall be blown as we talk i gotta stop saying that it's overused today already we are going to talk about the interquartile range wait we just learned what the range is right so why not talk about quarters and to do that, let's talk about four quarters. When we look at four quarters right here, there we go, four quarters, which if I label these quarters, quarter one, quarter two, quarter three, quarter four, what quarters are the interquarters? Two and three are the interquarters. How much money, if I, take, if I give you those interquarters, how much money do you have? 50 cents. So wait, we just, we just came up with a definition of the interquarters. The interquarters are the middle 50%. And if we say range, then we would just say the distance of the middle 50%, how far it spans. From the what percentile right here, how much are you at right here? The 25th percentile, and how much are you at right here? 75th. The interquartile range is the difference between the 75th and 25th percentile. Let me ask you this, let's come up with worth this. How many quarters have you added up when you get to this point right here? Let's call that Q3. And what do you think we'll call this right here? Q1. Does that make sense? This is Q3, the 75th percentile, three quarters. Q1, the 25th percentile. What is the formula 
10 point question online, type it out or in class, yell it out. What's the, oh my gosh, Jonathan. <laughs> Do it. Jonathan, I couldn't even ask it. Yes, Q3 minus Q1, you know what it is. Because max minus min is range, right? Max is your big number, min is your small number, which is up here, max minus min. Q3 minus Q1, it just gets you the distance between those two numbers. You guys are doing great. So the difference between Q3 and Q1 is going to be the interquartile range. That is the interquartile range. And we see that right here explained to us in depth in words. But why read words when we can look at money? What it looks like visually is 50% of the data. It might be hard for you to tell, but this is the top 25%, this is the lower 25%, and this is the middle 50% right there. The middle 50% of data is the inter quartile range, middle 50%. It's a measure of spread, because think about this. If the interquartile range is five, does that mean there's a lot of variation in grades? That means, would you want to be in the lower 25% of class or the upper 25%? And so the middle 50% only has a range of five, but what if it's 50? Now I'm telling you the difference between the 25th percentile and the 75th percentile is 50 points. And you're like, whoa, there's a lot of variation in this class because there's a lot of spread in the data. The data is very spread out. That's why the interquartile range is a measure of spread. But what if, what if I take these observations here and I move them way far over here? What happens to the interquartile range? I'm gonna move these, just these two bins right here, I'm gonna move them far to the right. Will it get bigger? Just these two blends right here, I'm gonna move them to the right. Does that change where the 75th percentile is in the 25th? It won't change it. What do you notice? The median is the 50th percentile. The IQR is the 25th to 75th percentile, right? They're both based on percentiles, and the percentiles are not impacted by outliers. Median goes with IQR, write that down. Median and IQR go together. Median as a measure of center is paired with IQR as a measure of spread. First person to answer, uh, so Veronica and Haley, and Morgan and Dylan, five points all. Median measure of center goes with IQR as a measure of spread. They're both based on percentiles. If we ever ask you to interpret the IQR for this graphic, I would say the middle 50% of, or excuse me, the middle 50% of earthquake magnitudes had a range of one. The IQR has a value of one, as you can see in this graphic. The middle 50% of earthquake magnitudes had a range of one. Because what is the IQR? The middle 50%, and it's the range of it. So once again, if you want to write down for this note, remember we do write this on the test, we say interpret the IQR. The middle 50% of earthquakes had a range of one in magnitude. And that is interpret the IQR. To formula find out the IQR, we simply take Q3 minus Q1, and I will solve that here for you right now. You sometimes get this on a test. Take Q3, which is the 75th percentile, minus Q1. Q3 minus Q1. The IQR is 86.75. That test question reads, what is the IQR? The next question might read, interpret your value for the IQR. The middle 50% of deaths in this data set had a range of 86.75 deaths. Does that make sense? The middle 50% of deaths in this data set, of how many deaths there were per year, had a range of 86.75. The middle 50% of the deaths, fun stuff, <laughs> had a range of 86.75, the middle 50%. We've already learned these concepts. We're doing great. 20 minutes to go and two, th two big things to learn. Power up with your coffee. So when we look at this right here, we have a histogram. A right skewed, distri right -skewed distribution that looks to be primarily unimodal. I'm not gonna call that a second peak. I would say this is mainly unimodal. Because if you change bin widths, it gets wacky. What's the bin widths here? These questions are like, give me questions on the test. 0.5. I think it's 0.5, right? B 
because zero to two is a length of two, two divided by four is 0.5. Does that make sense to everybody? Or you could just check, check your work, put 0.5, 1, 1 1.52. Check your work that way just to make sure you get it. Always good to double check. Nice job on liners. Uh, yada, 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 yada. Five number summary. This is the same data that we have right here, which we just saw, but in a five number summary. Now, when we go back to our quarters, I want us to think about something. Let's put lines on these quarters. And I'm gonna go to paint to do this. I used to annotate this on the screen. I need to go to snipping tool. And then I'm gonna do it. If you ever forget the five number summary, draw your quarters on your test and do this. Take a line and put, boop, there we go. Take a line, put one in the middle. What do you think that is? What would be the line at the middle of all the quarters? The median, which represents the 50th percentile. The median, which is the 50th percentile. And then if we go ahead and put a line at the very start of it, when we put a line at the very start of it, what do you think that will represent? The min, the lowest value in the data set. How about a line at the very top? The maximum. How about a line after one quarter? Quartile one. How about a line after three quarters? Quartile three. Go ahead and write that down, do little circles. And we have starting at the bottom, the minimum value, which is the zero percentile. The 25th percentile, which is Q1, you've added up one quarter. This can be called Q2 also. Then we have Q3, this was the median. Q2 means the same thing, two quarters of the data, the 50th percentile, and then the maximum. And even more, this box that I've drawn right here, that box, the width, the length of that box is now the what? It's not the full range, the IQR, right? Nice dial in line, nice dial, right? It's the IQR, yes. The range would be uh, from the min to the max. That is the range of the data right there. Nice job, everyone. Great participation today. So let's look at this in the notes right here. So you could put your quarters between here if you wanted, quarter, 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 and these are the lines I was drawing. Uh, if you notice, this does have a bit of a right skew because it's pulled to the right, right to the high, left to the low, and you see that there's outliers on the high side of it. So we do have a bit of a right skew. Let's go ahead and start drawing this box plot right here. As we said, the median is the 50th percentile. That is actually the line in the middle of the box plot. The box itself is from Q1 to Q3. That is the box. The line does not have to be directly in the center because the median could be close to the bottom, close to the top, just depends where the 50th percentile is. Next, and we will never make you draw these out, but this is an important thing to remember. These fences that tell you where outliers begin are exactly 1.5 IQRs above and below. And do you see what I've done here? I have visually taken the IQR and I am showing you that if I go up and down one and a half IQRs, that's where the fence is. Does that make sense visually right there? 1.5 IQRs below Q1 and 1.5 IQRs above Q3. So if you wanted to figure this out, this would be a tougher test question. I need to first figure out what an IQR is. Please write the formula looking at the top right of the screen for what an IQR, what the IQR is here. What is the formula? Does anyone know? And what are the numbers for that? Up there in the top right, you're all right. Sharon, five points, and right here, Isabella, five points. 2.93 minus 1.3. One five, that is the distance of the IQR, and that makes, look at it visually. Does that look to be about 1.7 in distance? Then I'm gonna multiply that by how much, because I wanna go up and down this many IQRs. I'm gonna multiply it by, just look at the visual over here, 1.5.
and that is 1.5 IQRs. Does that make sense? Then I'm going to add that to what value to find the upper fence? I'm gonna add it to Q3. I'm gonna go up, I'm gonna go up this amount from Q3, and I'm gonna go down this amount from Q1. Does that make sense? If you just look at it visually, do you see how I'm going 1.5 IQRs below Q1, 1.5 IQRs above Q3? So I can take this, this 1.5 IQRs I found right here and go above and below. We don't usually put big test questions like this, but you never know. And we might tell you like, where's the fence or stuff like that. And this is 5.6 and that looks to be about where that fence is as best we could draw it. But this is where the fence is. This is where outliers would start. It doesn't mean the data is there. So let's take a look. Wait, can you have negative wind speed? Can the wind be like going back? I don't know. What does negative wind mean? If it wind's going, it's a speed, right? Can't be negative. So there is no data right here. Does that make sense? There's also no data right in here, which is a very small spot. But we'll put the whiskers as far as the data goes before it hits the fence. The fence is just where outliers will begin, and we do have some high outliers. These are outliers. They are more than 1.5 IQRs above Q3 or more than 1.5 IQRs below Q1. That is a good definition. Outliers on a box plot are more than 1.5 IQRs above Q3 or more than 1.5 IQRs below Q1. Those are outliers on a box plot as defined. Sometimes they put a star for three. You don't need to know that. That's... I'll be like, that's too picky of a test question if we ever write that. If I gloss over something, it's because that's kind of a nuanced thing that they do. So to repeat, outliers on a box plot are 1.5 IQRs above Q3 or 1.5 IQRs below Q1. So think about that. The central 50% of the data is right here. So we're trying to find the stuff that's pretty far away. And 1.5 is what is generally used. That is the common what is an outlier. Sometimes people use different things, but pretty much everybody uses that. So it's always 1.5 unless people use a different standard and some disciplines might do it, but it's pretty universal 1.5 because you don't want to start doing graphics all differently for different things and then people get confused. But sometimes some disciplines like, we're going to do 1.67 because of this. And you're like, okay, now it's confusing because you want a common standard across. Great questions though. Then you simply remove the fences because those are just kind of a drawing technique. The good news is, is software will give this for us. But it's important we know in a box plot what we're seeing. What is the maximum value in this data set? It's very close to what? Nine. What is the, and that's because here's the maximum, what is the 75th percentile in this data set? Very close to what? Three. That's the 70th. Remember, the box is 25th to 75th with 50th in the middle. This gives you positions, min, Q1, median, Q3, and max. Do you see how far I had to go to get to the max? That's because this distribution was what? Skewed to the, to the right. Right skewed, so it's pulled out. And that's because there's a long distance between here to here. And now let me ask you this question. From here and above, and here and below, where is there more data? See, that's, if I go here, it's not as easy to tell. From here and above, or from three and below, where is there more data? Three and above or three and below? Three. Very correct, three and below. And it's easier to see here, because although this is a longer distance, there's not as much data. What percent of data is above here? Right here, what percent of data is above here? 25%, that's exactly correct. And above here is 50%, above here is 75, and above here is 100% of the data. So, and you see there's no zero wind speed. This is more exact because this could contain zero, but apparently no day had an average wind speed of zero. Wind does something during a day. This is how jump shows it. Just same sort of thing going on right here. Jump doesn't put the star, so that's why I kind of gloss over it, because we'll use jump for your tests. We do not ask you to draw box plots. Last few concepts, let's do it. Today we're gonna end like right on time. 
how do you find the mean? Somebody tell us the complicated way of finding the mean. It might be easier to just say, you just take all the numbers and what? <laughs> Jonathan, two points, Jonathan. You just do what? Just divide them up by how many numbers there are. You just sum the numbers and divide them up. I think everyone knows this. To find the mean, you add them all up and you divide by how many numbers there are. Nice job online to answer that question. Throw yourself one more point. I love it. I love all the responses we're getting. Keep it up. If by the end of the semester, we're still talking this much. We're going to destroy the grades and they're going to get mad at me, which is fine. So the mean, the problem is this. When we compute the mean, and I'll show you. It's easier to use jump for this example. Do you think that the mean is impacted by outliers? Well, think of what you told me. How do you find the mean? You take all the numbers, add them up, and divide by how many numbers there are. So if we have 10, 50, and 100, what is the median of this data set? 50. And the mean is 53.3. That, that's kind of very close mean and median. It's, it's a little bit symmetric almost, and I, I could have made it uh, 90. And I should put auto do on here. And let me change it to redo, auto recalculate. Cool. Now the mean is 50 and the median is 50 because it's a symmetric data set. Look at those differences. Box plot looks kind of weird because it's such a small data set. But now uh, 900. What, what's the median going to be? What? Yes, you are correct. And now we can't even see it. It didn't auto do the graphic properly. It's off the scale. But look at the mean. Well, I, I'll change that median. I'll get it. Take that median. What happened to the median? 50. It's crazy. The median is not impacted by skew. Never. Median can't be touched by skew. Also, you notice Q1 didn't change. This is such a small data set that Q3 changed. I could change this around by uh, making it a little bit bigger so we don't have the, and then let's put this here. And now you notice uh, that the, still a smallish data set. Sure. Okay, there we go. So now let's put this to this. If you notice Q, I uh, shouldn't have changed that value. Oh, I think maybe I hadn't hit enter on something. Cool. Um, Q3 did not change and Q1 did not change. Only the maximum value is changing when I change this because the IQR and the, me the, IQR and the median do not change with outliers. Now, with it being a small data set, you might see something else change in here. It's just so small that percentiles are based on very few numbers. But outliers will not impact the median and the IQR. Outliers will impact the mean and the standard deviation. Mean is like median. They are both measures of what? Mean and median are both measures of? The middle. I'll take that. Five points right there. Center. Shape, center, spread, unusual features. Where IQR and standard deviation, and look at my standard deviation got bigger, but it's, it's, being, it's being inflated by the large outlier. The IQR and the standard deviation, good notes to take, are both measures of, IQR and standard deviation are both measures of, kind of Jonathan got, ah, oh, yes. Bianca got it. Spread. Range is also a measure of spread. And IQR stands for interquartile range. Interquartile range. IQR and standard deviation are both measures of spread. Mean and, standard, mean and median are both measures of center. The mean goes with the, and just look at the output, the mean goes with the what? The mean as a measure of center goes with the blank as a measure of spread. Look at the output over here. Standard deviation, nice job, Veronica. Mean with standard deviation, five points, Veronica and Johnson. Um, Jonathan, so do you see mean and standard deviation? They go together, but they are both impacted by what? They can both be inflated by outliers and skew. Nice job, another five points. So, um, but when we have median, median, look at this portion of the data, median as a measure of center goes with IQR is the measure of spread. Morgan, five points. Median as a measure of center goes with IQR as a measure of spread, and they are impacted or not impacted by outliers? Not impacted because they're percentile based. And this is the last few concepts we're talking about right here. Standard deviation, you do not have to calculate. 
Standard deviation is just how spread out it is. If I do this right here, I am increasing the spread of the data set and I am increasing the standard deviation. Standard deviations are just how much things differ from the mean. And look at that. Why would we pair the standard deviation with the mean? Because it's a measure of difference from the mean. And to get it, we would use this formula right here and square root it. Very simple concept to write down that sometimes turns into a test question. Standard deviation squared is variance. It's literally just memorization. The notation for standard deviation is S. So S squared is variance. Standard deviation squared is the variance. We're going to go right up here to the end, guys, because we only have a few more things to talk about. Standard deviation squared is variance. And if you square root it, you get standard deviation. Standard deviation is a measure of how far things are spread out from the mean. To increase your standard deviation, you do this, and you'd also be increasing your IQR, because that's a measure of spread also. We will never, ever have you solve standard deviation. Do not do those by hand. Use an online calculator or your TI calculator. Do not, do not, do not. And we are near the end. I think this is the last slides right here. And let's use it to review, and we'll do those next time. So this first graphic right here, let's do the easy one. Let's do number two. A or B, and we're going to write to 620. We're going to go through 620. Which of these has a greater standard deviation? A or B down here at the bottom? The same. The same. Because they both have the same spread. Now, this one tricks people. A or B, which one has it? Let's see A or B. Which one has the greater standard deviation? Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Okay, I want you to tell me this much. If you were to take A, would you have to clump it up more or spread it out more to make B? If you were to take A, you'd have to spread it out more to make B. Does that make sense? You'd kind of spread it out more like that. Does that make sense? So which one has the bigger spread, A or B? So which one has the bigger standard deviation? B, measure of spread. Yes, we're getting it. Easy one up top. Which one has the bigger standard deviation? Uh-oh. If you were to take B, would you have to clump it up more or spread it out more to make A? Spread it out more. You guys getting it? This is why we practice these. This is my, like, we got this. We got, like, one and a half more minutes. Um, so if you take B and spread it out more, you'll make A. So what has the greater standard deviation? Let's see it online. They're very certain of it now. It is A. I don't like that lower one. I like this top one right here. Nice and easy one up top. You ready? Think, think about it. Before you say your answer, be like, okay, if I had to make the other one, what would I do? Which has the greater standard deviation, A or B? B. B. Because if you were to take A, you'd have to spread it out more. So B is more spread out. Does that make sense? Standard deviation is just a measure of how spread out the data is from the center. Which of the bottom ones, A or B? We're seeing it online right now. A, yep. Is, is everyone getting this, how this works? Easy one up top. A or B? Literally, B has just been spread out more, right? It's the same thing, just spread out. Down below, A or B? Since it's mirror imaged, it's the same. It's just same spread. Get ready for the not so nice one. The top one is A because it's more, B has a central mode, and if you spread it out more towards its sides, it would make A. Does that make sense? So A is more spread out. But the bottom one has appeared on tests, and is it A or B? Does anyone know why it's B? We'll end on this trick question, then I'll take questions from everyone. It is B because of the number line. I don't like pulling tricks like this. That's the trick. It's B because of the number line. Um, yes, Bianca right there, uh, five points. Nice job. And Jonathan, five points also. You guys, yeah, I know that's such a trick question. We end with a trick. Um, so watch out for stuff like that. There's really, it's like one question on the test is like a trick. It's probably like a two-pointer. We don't try to put those on there, but we want you to look at the details. I, I don't like, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. I'll fight against the trick questions. I will fight against them. I'll fight for you guys. Um, but that does it. Stay if you have questions. Um, I also, see it goes from three to 16. That's a length of 13. This only has a length of six. So it looks like this is probably more spread out. I wish it was a little more obvious. And if I were writing this as a test question, 
I might make this from three to 50 and then it'd be like obvious. It's like, well, that has a length of 47. So it's obviously a lot more spread out because there's, there's a lot larger range to it. Range, if you have a larger range of a larger standard deviation, range is a measure of spread. It's kind of a global one. So remember, last but not least, IQR and median go together and the mean and the standard deviation go together. Mean and median are measures of center. Standard deviation, IQR measures of spread. Range is a measure of spread also. You guys are free to go ask questions if you got them. We ended right on time and we got through every little thing. We'll talk about this last little bit later, not today. Really, those don't turn. It's just review, review. Feel free to ask questions if you got them. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Last thing. Do the survey. Lynette, 10 points. Lynette, uh, do the survey. I will send out reminders. Good news even. I'll be telling everyone that you have until Tuesday night to do it. We talked as instructors. I was waiting until the next announcement I send uh, to say you have until Tuesday night to do it. We can get two points on the first test. I will do my best to encourage everyone to do it. So we won't have class on Monday, will we? So next time I'll talk to you guys, the survey will be done. I'll send out reminders. And so we have people probably watching it. Do the survey. It takes what, five, 10 minutes tops? It takes five, 10 minutes. Do the survey. You guys do the survey? Head on out, head on off. You got to go. 10 minutes tops. Great job, everybody. Um, question in class, I'll take the online. Go ahead. Uh, just real quick, um, the, the, uh, the textbook, it says I only have seven more days on the Yes, a lot of people have been emailing about the textbook. Uh, you will get your code before, because today's Wednesday, and that's why we wait to give you the code till day one. I One semester, when we started this, I gave out the code like three days before. And they're like, oh, we're going to send it right when their trial periods are right about to end. And I was like, uh, uh, oops. <laughs> uh, yeah, so that's why we give it to you guys on day one. So that way there's no, like, you will get it. I estimate, and a few people emailed about this, I estimate you will get it Friday or Monday. You have until next Wednesday, so everything should go smoothly. And if you don't have it by Monday, I'll be contacting the bookstore. But the thing is they want to make sure people don't get charged for it if they drop the class. No, I just wanted to make no sure great seven, question. Seven days, well, I'm glad you asked because I've gotten quite a few emails and people want to know because they're like, ah, I don't want to. <laughs> uh -oh. Let's see. Can you redo the last part about comparing spread? Sure. Um, so you will get the code before it ends. Uh, what question specifically did you have about comparing the spreads? Uh, are you talking about the last histogram? Is that what you would like? All of it. Okay. So standard deviation, just to review here a little bit, standard deviations are a measure of spread. And I can show you this right here. Let's, uh, let's look at jump again and do another quick example or two. So I have a big number line right here. Let's put the number line. Here we go. And so we're just going to visualize a little bit here and uh, do some just examples. Okay. Let me get the jump data frame open. And, oops, heard a lot of noises. I'm going to mute people. I think they muted themselves. Good. Okay. So let's take a look here and let's just put in, and you, as you guys can see, I'm going to make a central mound here in the data set. Um, this cool let me grab the hand tool right here and change bin widths there we go so i can actually change bin widths and all that stuff and um kind of making something a little bit normal here oops that was wrong ay 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 of course I'm, i put in one wrong number i tried to put in 34. okay um i have a pretty normal looking distribution right here and if you notice, the standard deviation is 19. But if I start to add in some outliers to this distribution, which we'll need a little bit of room to see, you can watch my standard deviation get bigger. So when I put in this value right here of 200, the standard deviation gets huge. But if this value is more closer to the center, my standard deviation is actually going to get smaller. Or let me go right near the center, 54. You see, now I'm putting in the mean because they're not differing from the mean. And the data is getting more peaked. It's getting tighter around it. So as I keep making this more peaked and more tighter, because I'm building up the data in that bin right there, just so you can see, I'll put a count axis on here, which is showing that I'm putting more observations in there. Um, so I'm putting more observations in the center. All those 54s I'm putting in there are making the standard deviation smaller because the standard deviation are how much things differ from the mean. How much does 54 differ from the mean? How much does 54 differ from the mean? Just look at the data right here. 
it doesn't differ at all. 54 is the mean. So by adding in more data here, I'm clumping it up around the mean. But if I change these data value points to things like 89, you'll see the standard deviations start to go up. Or I put in 1, 89. If you notice, the standard deviation is now inflating, and also you're seeing the outsides of it get bigger. Visually speaking, um, the standard deviation is how far spread out it is from the center. So as you notice, as I change this right here, what we see is that um, the distribution is now kind of bimodal and more pushed out. And I increase the standard deviation because things deviate more from the mean. So yeah, the more peaked it is, the, the less the standard deviation, the more spread out it is. You also do have to look at the number line because it can give you an idea of what's going on. Lots of good questions. I'm going to read it. For standard deviation, do you compare who has a larger spread? If so, confused on when the spread is equivalent. How do you tell in that scenario? So if the spread is literally the same, then um, like visually, if it's identical, they would have the same standard deviations. Um, we don't usually try to put too many trick questions on the test like this. I just try to cover every little base. So higher the peak, the less standard deviation. That is correct. Like if it's really bunched together like this, that's not a high standard deviation. Um, if it's more spread out, then there's more standard deviation. So if you notice, as I change this once again to a more peaked distribution, just keep your eyes on this standard deviation value right here. Um, as you notice, it gets more clumped towards the center. The standard deviation keeps going down because literally what standard deviation means is how much things deviate from the mean. So a large standard deviation means a large deviation from the mean, where a small standard deviation means everything's clumped up around the mean. Great, great questions. Um, yeah, I'll go over anything again. This is just the bonus time of class. Uh, great questions. I'm glad this is in the video. So let me see if I answered everyone else's. Thank you for everyone who asked that great question. So the higher the peak, the less standard deviation. Very correct. Okay, so the further away the data is from the mean, the larger the spread. That, that is literally how it's calculated. That is correct. Can you explain the left to the low, right to the high again? Of course, more than happy to. And we can even use the visual right here. Um, let's delete off some of these observations. I, I like showing data being created. It's, it's kind of cool. It's like you can create your own data and then just run it. And I love the auto recalc and jump. I didn't even know this feature for like the first three years I used it. Um, so here we are. Let's delete these rows. I'm a crazy perfectionist. Done. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with some very low values here, like 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. If you notice, those numbers build up in the bin right there because they're in the 0 to 12.5 bin. So I just built up that bin a whole bunch. I'm going to go 2, 2, 3, 3, 4, 4, 5, 6, 6, 7, 7, 8. I'm actually going to change the orientation of this now um, so we can see what's going on. And here we are. So that's a little better visual. And you can see when I put in something like 14, it'll now appear next to it right there because that's in the – these bin widths are really hard to know what they are. I'm not going to dare say what those bin widths are. Another 2.5. Whoops, that's off the scale. I meant to put in that. And sure. Here we go. Uh, so this right here, cool. I'm happy with this. This is a very right skewed distribution. Um, right skew is when the tail is pulled out to the right side. So right to the high, when I say right to the high, I'm telling you which way the tail is pulled out. Right is pulled out to the high side where left is pulled out to the low side. So right to the high, left to the low, if you notice, the tail is pulled out. And it's what way the outliers go. We also see some interesting stuff up here that this value, for those who we have a few people still watching, this value right here is two things on this box plot. Can anyone tell me what that is? You can actually cheat and look to the right. Um, that value right there is the blank and the blank on the box plot. It represents two things, actually. I'll tell you in a half second here, and you can look at the data on the, the quantiles on the right. That value right there is the minimum value, and it is also Q1. There's actually no tail to this. And you can cheat, and you can look over here, and you can see 1, which is right here, is the minimum value. It is also Q1. That's, that's why there's no whisker to this box plot. Uh, the median is right here. The Q3 is right here. This is actually the mean, and the mean is close to Q3. So 
The mean is 7.3, and the Q3 is there. The mean's a little bit lower. The center of the diamond. That's not usually included in all box plots. That's why I didn't mention it today. Jump just kind of goes the extra mile and shows you where the mean is at. The mean follows the skew. Does everyone see that this is the median, and the mean is being pulled towards the skew? So if you want to know which way something is skewed, you could look at the mean, and the skew will be pulled to the high side. So skewed to the high, we could reverse this and do skewed to the low and do something like 26, 26, 26, 26, 26. And if you notice, as I type in those observations, they appear and I'm trying to think. <laughs> Bit of an odd one right there. Um, let's go. Cool. And this is now skewed to low side. And we'll put this as, sure. That's skewed to the low, just depends. I mean, that's, that's a left skew right there. It's kind of got a block of outliers, but it's, it, the tail goes to the left now. Uh, awesome, no, so glad to help you guys. And I like, I like kind of making these on the fly. It's so fun to be like, you could just make this. And you see there's uh, a bin width again of 2.5 and Siri's listening to me, but that's got that. So where do the end of the whiskers go? Um, the end of the whiskers, uh, well, here, right here, this one's an interesting one, too. But you notice how I have all this data clumped here at the top? And that's why 30 is the maximum end Q3. So the whiskers can go 1.5 IQRs above Q3, but Q3 is 30. We see that right here. And the maximum value is 30. So there are no whiskers. But if we turn this into like 35, we would see the whisker appear. If you notice, the whisker magically appears there. But if this is way far away, like, uh, well, my IQR here is 21. So that means uh, 21 times 1.5, fun times, is 31.5, which means I need to go 31.5 31.5 above Q3. So if I put this in as 62, It'll be an outlier, and let's view that. It went off the scale. But if I put this in at 61, it should not be an outlier. So 62 is an outlier because that's more than 1.5 IQRs above, but 61 is not an outlier. So anything I put in here below that will create a tail, and it'll go to that point. But if I put something more than 1.5 IQRs above, um, and once again, I found the IQR by doing Q3 minus Q1. The IQR was 21. Love it. You guys seem to be liking this. I'm more than happy to help you guys out with this. I see the whiskers and 1.5 above and below. Yes, so whatever outside is an outlier and it only goes up to those values, only up to those values. If something's outside of that range, uh, it won't be included. And if there's a gap, you won't see it. Um, so to also show, I think we have enough values in here. If I have 55 and then I have 62, you'll see a gap between those um, because there's just no data values. So 44, you see there's a gap and I might have enough, this might change the IQR. Watch my IQR, because that'll reconfigure how the box plot is being formulated. No, it didn't. Um, I had enough data points to do that. So 62 is the outlier. 62 is the only outlier in this data set. Uh, and this is a strict definition for box plots. We'll have another way to term outliers. Uh, the way we will also describe them for normal data is uh, two or three standard deviations. More on that later, don't worry about that yet. Um, two standard deviations um, above or below the mean. I usually go by two standard deviation rule. Some people go by three. And on the test, when I grade it, I count either answer. Um, but when we talk about IQRs, it's 1.5 IQRs above Q3 or 1.5 IQRs below Q1 is where an outlier is. These whiskers just indicate uh, where your data is, and it shows data that is kind of a little bit high and data that's a little bit low, but not outliers. More questions if you have them. I'm more than happy to review these things with you guys. About the online quizzes, does automatically grade your score if you're not finished and you leave the quiz? I think you can go back. Uh, if you find the answer to that question, you, I'm pretty sure you can go back. Maybe someone else who's still hanging around knows, but um, pretty sure you can go back. Yeah. Um, if you submit it, it'll do it, but um, until you hit submit, it doesn't do it. I think yesterday it graded me when I left, even when I didn't. If you need one more attempt at that one, I'll, I'll throw you another attempt um, if you somehow, yeah. I, I'm, you know, little things happen like that. If you're like, Brian, just email me, say, and, and if you use up your other three attempts, 
I know. Is it no class until next Wednesday? I know. It's crazy. Crazy. And I've just got, I've just got one class tomorrow morning and I've got office hours. Come to office hours if you guys want. And we're going to be setting up the new office either this week or next. And I'm going to have a screen and have lots of stuff. We'll be, I'm going to do like a grand opening of the office, probably do some candy and stuff. So we'll have a grand opening office day. I know. I love doing this class. I should maybe do donuts. I maybe we should do maker's donuts. You know what? I might do that. That's a good idea. Make, has anyone ever had maker's donuts? Awesome. Glad you guys are liking the class. We might do makers. Maybe we'll do makers donuts. Maybe I'll get like two dozen makers donuts and say like I'll, a grand opening at like 2 PM first, you know, uh, and maybe I'll even tell my old students like check out Brian's new office and they, maybe I'll get, I don't know, maybe I'll get a few dozen. I don't know. There's gonna be like a line of students out the door. <laughs> I show up and they're like, Brian, what did you say? What did you do? <laughs> but, um, maybe we'll, we'll, maybe I'll get some makers donuts and some other treats like some, uh, I need to order. Uh, yeah, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll do, I don't, I'll do one. I don't know. I've had duck donuts. I like them both. I like them both. So <laughs> my girlfriend loves balloons. So you don't have to bring me anything. You never have to bring me anything. I feel so bad when students bring me stuff. They're like, it's so nice. I, I can't, there's really very little I can accept from you guys. I can't, it has to be like, Hey Brian, I brought you a Snickers bar, like a fun size Snickers bar. If you're like, Brian, I bought you a jumbo bag of Snickers. I'm like, I can't take that. <laughs> or, hey, Brian, I brought you a balloon. I'm sure I, I could take a balloon. It's, it's, I can only accept the most minimum of things ever from students. Like, it, it has to be like, you would not change someone's grade for a bite-sized Snickers bar. Like, hey, Brian, I, just, I got a bite-sized Snickers. I didn't want it. Here you go. You look hungry. I can't accept that. I can't accept Hey, Brian, here's a $50 gift card for Cheesecake Factory. It, it sucks because I've had some very nice students. And I have to be like, I'm sorry, we have a policy. It, it's just to make sure that, you know, I've had people give me things like Cheesecake Factory. And I have to say, like, I'm so sorry. Because, um, if you, hey, Brian, here's a Snickers bar. Okay, cool. I'm hungry. You know, not a big one. Don't give me a big one. <laughs> I'm limited. Anyways, any other questions about what's going on with the world today? Nice job. Nice job, everybody. Awesome. Glad to help you guys. I think we're good. Awesome. Have a great weekend, everybody. Thanks for staying around. Um, I'll upload this later. Uh, if no one else has any questions, we'll, we'll slam. Do you post all these recordings, lectures online? Yes. Let's check that out. We'll end the video with that just so people can see again. Uh, right here where we have video lecture, it'll be next to it. And I know I went a little quick at the end. I'm glad we kind of re-talked over it for the people who wanted just a little refresher. Sorry, hiccups. Um, but I wanted to make sure we got through it and have it all in one video video so you can go back and check it out. Awesome. So you will see chapter two video lecture right next to it. Easy place to find. Cool. Okay. Well, I'll hang out for about 10 more seconds and see if there's anything else. Have a good night, everybody. I'm just waiting to see if anyone messages in and says, wait, hit enter. I'll be leaving in five. Hit enter if you've typed something. Three, two, hit enter. One, good night, everybody.